go. All right, folks, it's 1202 and I would like to call to order our April 28th meeting of Connecticut State Community College Senate. Uh, we have had one request for a change to the agenda and that is removing an update from the bylaws committee. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you for just a minute. Are there any objections to withdrawing the bylaw committee update? Are there any objections? Hearing no objections, I'm, uh, is there a motion to accept the agenda as presented? I'll make the motion. And who was that? Sandra Vitale. Thank you, Sandy. Is there a second? This is Roberta, I can second. Thank you, Roberta. Are there any objections to accepting the agenda as presented? Very good. I will stop sharing and we have an agenda. So I have a, I have a few updates and comments as we get our meeting underway. Uh, in the last month, we have worked to establish stronger governance, transparency and effectiveness with the Senate. Uh, we are, we have succeeded in establishing an email account and most of you have received items from the college senate email account um, another project we've been working on is the issue of the compensation and release survey uh, 29 out of 30 people participated in the the longer survey and already the survey i sent this morning that will update that information uh, we have 18 participants so i will ask that by the end of this meeting or 245 actually that you update your response so that I can forward accurate data to President Maduco. Uh, some of the other things that we are working on include launching a web page that will include our minutes, agenda, and links to our future meetings. Until the web page is active, please feel free to continue to distribute our final agenda with the link to your campus. Uh, however, uh, before that becomes practice, I am asking you to think about the degree to which we permit guests to speak and or participate in our meetings, and that will be a discussion that we have later on in the agenda. In order to permit more effective use of our time together, we are petitioning the CIO for CSCU to use Zoom for our meetings beginning this fall. CSCU faculty already use Zoom, and it is the most preferred platform platform in higher education across the US and the globe, and many institutions and organizations have far higher standards of security than we do. To that end, I am asking for three to five people to help join a work group that will research and frame that issue uh, and possibly meet with the CIO. So if you're interested and able to participate in that, please drop your name in the chat and we will be in touch. Finally, the last thing I am asking of you today is for you to consider the degree to which we use recorded video. Thus far, our meetings are recorded with the expressed intention of supporting documenting our minutes, and they are not shared nor are they posted. And while I support that use, I am concerned that recording may inhibit frank discussions and deliberations by our senators and it is not clear to me what response would be required if we received a freedom of information request. So, uh, to that end, I would, uh, I am asking if anyone is on a records disposal for your current college, if you could let us know so that we can work with you to answer those questions, I would appreciate it. Thank you all for the work that you are doing to establish Connecticut State Senate as an effective organization that respond governance group that responds uh, to the concerns of our constituents. And with that, I would like to is is President Maduco here for his welcome. Oh, it's Nicola. I don't think there's anyone here from Connecticut State. Is there? I don't. 
This Who's is here? Harrison. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see you. I don't like um, Ms. Uh, Mike's not here. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, okay. we have uh, it's, it's the global majority retreat. So a lot of our folks are over there. So I am. I am here representing. So okay. thank you. Okay. Do, do you have anything today or we, you are you filling in in case there are questions, comments, thoughts and concerns? No, I'm just, I do not have anything. Thank you. Well, I have to say we are making good time on a tight time schedule. So, so this is great. Uh, so, Peter, are you ready to present on the part time uh, representation issue? Senator Astor, yes. mm -hmm. here you are. Um, for the uh, subcommittee, uh, Ariel Robinson will be doing the main presentation. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah. I can go ahead and get started. Again, I want uh, this will be very, very short and, and uh, I want to be respectful of time. But one thing that we were discussing was um, the importance of equity uh, and representation in this group. So we spent the last couple of days in discussing uh, the importance of having part timers. And the idea is that uh, we are, it's important to hear voices uh, and challenges uh, that part timers may face. Now, some folks may argue that, uh, and we'll probably get into this later, but the idea is that um, while we don't have the answers, whether uh, compensation would happen, whether folks would get an AR or CR, we're not really there sure, but I think the importance that we have a conversation of um, including part-timers in the conversation, uh, including um, hearing out their challenges, and of course, assuring that across the board that uh, whatever decisions are made through committees or through the Senate, uh, part-timers are aware uh, and they could um, share with their uh, other folks um, and, and make sure that we're all, all heard. So um, again, they are made aware of statewide access, uh, I'm sorry, statewide events, calendars and scheduling, uh, scheduling issues. Uh, they're made aware of college standards and policies and rec make, can make recommendations on their, on their behalf. Um, same goes with college services, resources, and strategic initiatives. Uh, and then also address other concerns and issues with regards to students, faculty, or staff in the uh, CT state system. Um, again, the idea is to have a, a voice, um, and we would uh, like to have a conversation and consider that. Thank you. Ariel and Peter, is it your expectation that you will bring a recommendation to Congress, uh, to the Senate? Oh, I, I believe we have. Um, I'm, I'm not sure where it would be located at the moment. I can put it up. I, I, I believe we mailed it to you uh, the other day. Uh, oh, I didn't realize that you were finished because you said you were still meeting. So I'll, I'll tell you what, is it, is it acceptable if I email that out after this meeting at our next meeting, we uh, add it to the agenda for a discussion item? Um, I, I guess so. Sure. I, I, like I said, I think, uh, uh, if, since this is going in the bylaws in terms of representation. I, I sort of feel the sooner uh, we uh, deal with it, the better uh, before the bylaws sort of get um, written in stone, so to speak. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I would, it would accept that uh, if that appears to be the uh, um, only way to, uh, to do it. I'm, I'm trying to just uh, bring this up um, and it'll take me a second. Uh, I don't want to waste uh, your time on this, but um... while you do that, maybe we have questions while from Angela. You're doing that. Yep, while you're doing <laughs> that, uh, there there are some questions. So, uh, John, who was first? Angelo and then uh, Nicola. Thank you, Angelo. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I was actually thinking, uh, would it be better if we had a part time? Uh, can folks hear? 
Angela, we can't hear you. No, I can't hear him. Hold on. So sorry. There. Okay. Nick, do you want to go while Angelo fixes his audio? But can you hear me now? Oh, there, there you go. Yes, Angelo, we okay. can. Now, I was actually, I'd like to suggest, you know, I think it would be in a way more effective if we, we could actually hear directly from the part-timer or the part-timers. Uh, I, I mean, I heard they, 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 it sounds like kind of a foreign body. I, I think it would make more of an impact if we could hear the reasons uh, why, you know, of this, you know, if they would or could come to this body and make a presentation themselves, just a thought. Thank you, uh, Nick. Um, so I have a couple comments slash questions while on this i like the idea of having part-time representation on this body because i feel it is equitable and it is fair but i have questions about how it would actually be carried out i mean i was a part-timer for or adjunct for two years before i got my full-time position and i remember how incredibly stressful it was to be an adjunct when you're trying to cobble together a living wage so 100 percent understand that but these are my concerns and maybe they are addressed and if they're not addressed then maybe it's something that, that the subcommittee can address how do you plan on getting equal representation from every campus right would are we looking then for one adjunct from every campus because then this body would become ginormous would you be looking for regions or just whomever you know up to five adjuncts right but then you could kind of be unequal in its representation how will elections occur for these part timers? Um, how will the information for how would the how would they be able to meet? Right? Like, would there all of the adjuncts would have to be able to meet to discuss issues so that the represents the representatives would be able to vote on those issues for them? Um, right? How will that information be communicated out to each of those adjuncts? So I just see a lot of logistical questions and difficulties in how you would be able to address that in addition you know to the idea of any kind of compensation may i speak madam chairman all right mm -hmm. so um uh, we we looked at this and we decided we would be as modest as possible uh with this so we said that we, there would be one adjunct faculty represented representative and one part-time staff representative uh, so that would be for the entire system. So uh, these individuals would be um, highly motivated individuals, and uh, they would, um, in effect, uh, re represent um, the large number of adjuncts and part-timers we have. Um, this is so as to not change the composition of this body significantly by just having two additional people. And um, in terms of how they would be elected, well, we have a survey ready to be distributed um, once we get permission to distribute it amongst the uh, adjuncts and part-timers, which would indicate not only whether they want a representative, but whether they'd be willing to be the representative. And I think once that survey comes back, uh, which can be by as early as, say, the end of next week, uh, that we would uh, have a good idea of how many people would really like to do this and and uh, to what extent, uh, you know, we need to modify uh, that proposal to have more than one. But again, we're just being as modest and um, as possible with with the suggestion that we have a total of two part-time people added to our um, Senate roles. Um, and, and again, we would expect that uh, the individual senators, whether adjunct or part-time, would um, then have a distribution list so they could uh, let 
other part-timers know uh, what, uh, if anything, we covered that uh, is of particular importance to them. Um, in terms of how the elections would take place, um, we um, really did not get that far um, in terms of those mechanics, but I, I can see that um, I, I would guess that there would be no more than three or four people in the system who would really want the job. Um, and um, they could just be voted on um, statewide. Thank so, you, Peter. Yes, okay, thank you. Uh, Alan? Uh, thanks, Al. Uh, I'm just wondering, um, you know, because part-timers, adjuncts, um, have a lot of other hats. Some are themselves full-time staff members. Some are retirees. Uh, some may be full-time faculty at private institutions. Would we have any uh, restrictions on, you know, who would be eligible to serve, especially if we're gonna have a part-time staff member? Um, you know, would would a staff member who's also an adjunct be able to to fill that other role? All right. We did discuss this. Uh, the stipulations are that the adjunct faculty member has to have had two years of continuous service within our CT state system, and the part time staff uh, would have to have had uh, to work at least twelve hours a week uh, over a period of two years. So uh, those are the stipulations. Now, yes, I can see where someone with multiple hats might take the job, but I believe that those individuals who will be most interested in it will be those who have the primary role of either adjunct faculty or part-time uh, staff. Thank you, Peter. Is there a motion to move this recommendation to the bylaws committee. Oh, I'm sorry, Miguel. I just saw your hand. My apologies. That's okay. Um, I just so I just uh, on that last point, Peter. I just had a quick question. Um, the the 12 hour requirement um, for the staff side of the house. Um, I I find that a bit problematic um, for a couple of reasons. One is that um, not all part time EAs are 12 months. Uh, for and I'm thinking specifically, for example, of the library where they're on an academic semester contract, right? Um, and secondly, most of them don't don't have 12 hours, don't work 12 hours a week. They work 10 hours or you know nine hours, depending on how many days they're working, because they're they're working at night, um, covering the library. So um, I, I obviously this is going to be discussed further, but I, I that's a that's a big concern for me. I understand. Uh, I, I understand the purpose of having prior experience. So I might suggest a cumulative total or something like that versus a specific, something like that. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to bring that up for discussion. Your um, uh, modifications uh, are, are more than acceptable. I guess the whole idea was that we wanted people who had like a real commitment to uh, the, the state system. And uh, we've just felt that 12 hours was a, a ballpark figure um, based on what um, the staff people on our committee, which was actually 85 or 80% 80 of the committee uh, felt was a reasonable uh, number of hours. Uh, but um, that's certainly uh, open for discussion. So it, is there a motion to move this item to the bylaws and charter committee for further review and implementation. Or inclusion is probably a better word. I'll move. Is, is it possible to see the exact proposal? Um, Pete, Peter was pulling that up. Yeah, I was, hopefully he's just about ready. I was, I was trying to find it. Um, it's um, it's 
Hi, Peter. This is Jen. I think I have it up. Do you want me just to share it? Sure. Okay. Sorry, let me just, I have to, it's marked as draft, but it's not there. I have to. So this is like, you can just ignore the draft part. The way you could enlarge it. Sure. Good. Is that better? Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, sorry. Oh, of course I lost it. Ariel, do you have it? Let, let me see if I if I can I'll do this for you, folks. If it if it didn't change, if it didn't change, I have the version that Peter shared with me. I did not understand it to be your final version because it does say draft. But here you go. Okay. Is, is this still is this still yes, the most recent that's... version? Okay, there we. Go. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, if it is the will of the Senate, we could refer, we could refer this issue to the bylaws committee for further review and inclusion, and it will still come back to us at our next meeting. Well, this is Alan. I'll second Peter's motion to uh, send it to the bylaws committee. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Oh, Alice Miguel. Miguel, yes, sir. Um, just, just a quick point. If this motion passes, and I suspect it will, um, I would suggest that the uh, part-time committee um, uh, schedule, uh, uh, that we schedule a meeting, a joint meeting between the part-time committee and the, uh, uh, and the bylaws committee. Um, because I think, you know, we can, we can come up with a draft proposal largely based on what you're, what you have, uh, but we may need to tweak it some, and then we can present something next month. Okay. Very good. Any further discussion? All those, are there any objections? Maya, Maya has a question. Yep. Maya. Yeah, I apologize. Um, I know I'm a guest at this meeting, but I just, and I had to come late, Congress or I'm um, I just want to make sure that this group is mindful and there might be a, an outside discussion that needs to happen with the implications on part time faculty or part time adjuncts in regarding to uh, dual enrollment. Oh, yeah, because once once someone hits a certain thre a credit threshold or a contract threshold, they are now in a dual employment situation. And that could jeopardize their ability to teach and other things. So I think there might be some unintended consequences that need to be thought through with labor relations um, and contracts around this issue. So I just wanted to put that out there. I don't have solutions. I just wanted it to be a, a, a discussion point. It, it, Maya, are you, could that conversation happen with the bylaws and charter committee or does it need to happen in, or do you think it needs to happen in Senate? I think that it, it's more effective to have it with the joint uh, part-time and bylaws committee so that they are addressing any concerns explicitly. I would agree. I think that, again, 
I would imagine this involves a discussion with the labor unions as well as HR in general, because this is contract language. <laughs> and this, this might be something even broader because, you know, when someone gets a certain threshold, they go into benefits eligible and other things. So it, it's above my pay grade. <laughs> but these are the kinds of things that I think need to be talked through so that that information is, is just unknown when when someone is then an elected member, what the what the implications are. So we do have a motion in a second, uh, and it it looks like the the bylaws and part time committee, if this motion passes, will meet, and I will help facilitate having a labor relations and HR person uh, available at your meetings to make sure that we are in compliance with all contracts as well as um, work expectations. So if you are in favor of this motion to move this to the part to the bylaws committee, please raise your hand now. If you support this motion, please raise your hand now. And who, who is doing vote counts? Nick, is that you or John today? I can do it. We're at 27. 27. Thank you. Out of how to have out of how many participants today? Uh, well, we have 42 total, but I don't know how many are actually able to our members. Okay. Yeah. So Maya doesn't count. And that, that's okay. Yeah. We have 27. Yes. Uh, it just changed. Hold on one second. Uh, 27. Yep. Okay. Very good folks. Lower your hand. 28. <laughs> Go ahead and lower your hands. Do we have any hands left up John? No, we're clear. Okay. If you oppose this motion, please raise your hand. If you oppose this motion, please raise your hand. I see zero opposition. If you abstain, if you abstain, please raise your hand. Let's see three abstentions. Three abstentions. Very good. The motion passes and we will move this resolution to the Charter and Bylaws Committee. Thank you, folks. We are now moving on to a report from Connecticut State Curriculum Congress. So this is a new item that we added to the agenda. And we are actually looking for a volunteer who serves both at Congress as well as Senate to report to Senate when there is information that should be shared. Now, I will say that by this fall, we hope to formalize this, but Congress isn't, um, doesn't have, isn't as far along as their organizational process. So we're asking for a volunteer, both for this month and next month. So do we have a volunteer to share what's happened with Curriculum Congress? I guess it'll have to be it's either me or my dad, right? <laughs> are you the two who 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 are crossovers? Then then yes. If you could just share a little bit about what's happening there, we would appreciate it, Miguel. I yield to Miguel since uh, <laughs> this is very fresh from this morning. Um, did you want the report right now, Al? Yes, please, okay. if you're able. So yeah, so we uh, we we met this morning. Uh, met until twelve ten. Actually, we went over by forty minutes. Um, uh, this was the 1st month that we had business, um, for all sort of formal curricular business to, to vote. Um, they are, uh, we have been requested by, uh, by new Britain to prioritize. Items, curricular items, modifications and changes, et cetera. That have to go to the, BOR, uh, for a formal vote. 
Um, so that is what we were trying to get through as much as possible today. Um, we are also talking about, um, and, and Maya, maybe you can jump in on, on this, what we're, what we're calling threshold items um, in terms of things that become only informational versus requiring a formal vote by the board. You also have the added layer of the ASA review, um, and that, that is an added complication when that is necessary. Um, we will be meeting again next month uh, for the final meeting of the semester. However, there was talk of an emergency meeting because there are so many proposals that are of an urgent nature that have to be um, that have to be passed um, or at least considered this spring. Um, and then the last thing I will add is that we elected a chair uh, and a vice chair um, for the Congress. Uh, Jason, uh, my remind me of the last name. I'm sorry, I'm blanking on his last name. Jason's last name. Seabury. Seabury, thank you. Jason Seabury and um, uh, from Naugatuck Valley, I believe, and Christine Cherry from Gateway is the vice chair of, of the Congress. So we have a little bit of the structure in place. We were planning on presenting um, the draft of the bylaws um, for Congress, um, but we ran out of time. Uh, since we went into negative time uh, for all you math people, it's like I time. Um, so uh, anyway, that's that's sort of a quick report, and I'll try to field any questions. Maya, Murdad, if you have anything else to add to that report. Yeah, thank you, Miguel. I'll just add this to clarify as well. So the board has a threshold that what items they have to act on versus items that are informational from institutions. So, if a certificate or a degree program has more than 25% of the program change, so 15, 15 credits, for example, in a 60 credit degree, then it requires board action. Otherwise, if it's below threshold, it's an informational item with no action behind it. So, what we've prioritized are those items that do need to go to the board for action. And again, those are the program certificates that are above threshold. Any program or certificate that would be considered new to the board. So there was uh, one at least that was a, a legacy certificate in degrees. Actually, there were a couple of them that never made it into the alignment process. And so to the board, those are new for CT State, even though they have been in place for many years on campuses. Um, and then because you bring forward certificates and proposals, I'm sorry, certificates or degree proposals that are above threshold, any required courses that are designated in those certificates or degrees also need to come forward as part of the proposal for the degree or certificate. But otherwise, normally course changes or new courses within an institution do not go to the board for approval. It's only if they're required when the board is taking action on a certificate or a program. So those are the items that were prioritized. Nearly all of them that were the priority items went through. There were one or two items that had been pulled either by the SAC last week um, it didn't come forward, or there was one that was tabled um, today uh, for whatever reason. I think that's going to come forward next week. I'm sorry, next month. And then the math bundle is the other item that was pretty critical that did not have time to get through, but we believe that that's going to be addressed next um, the next meeting. But that will still be an informational item. So that's sort of the difference of what items have to go forward for action and the board's timeline. June 29th will be the day that they'll that any action items will be coming out of CT State. But if you back up the meetings before that, there's the ASA subcommittee to the board, and before that is the Academic Council of Deans and Provosts. And so at the Academic Council of Deans and Provosts, the deadline to get in for that meeting has already passed, but we've made accommodations with them um, to be able to get this information out of this month's cycle of governance to get to that ASA and, and uh, Academic Council in time. So that's sort of the timeline there. Uh, I know it's a little bit in the weeds, but it helps to clarify. The other thing that's important to note is the volume of items that have come forward to Congress this month um, is large. It was about 93 items. Next month, the cycle is about two thirds that size. But again, I remind the members that the reason for that volume is because governance was on pause for so long. And there were no action items taken in this academic year until this is the first month that any action items have come before governance for CT State. So it's very commendable how much work has been done. 
Um, it is an unusual circumstance to have this volume and in the future. It will certainly not be this type of volume once things level out. It's just an anomaly because of the backlog. That's all for me. Thanks. Thank you. Miguel, do you have anything else to add? No, I'm all set. And thank you, Maya, for the uh, audit information. Any questions to for for Maya or Miguel or Madad? We have a question from Hannah. Hannah. Yes. Um, the, we we discussed and are going to further investigate the option to have a consent agenda. Just because of the amount of courses coming forward, there was also some discussion about um, uh, discussing and rediscussing items that had already gone through two other bodies. Um, and I, and one other thing was, uh, I think a lot of the discussion was around prerequisites, and the suggestion was made that maybe pre prerequisites and co-requisites might have to be listed separately because there was some confusion. Thank you. Hannah's also a double dipper, so Hannah, if we could, if we could add Hannah to the list. <laughs> All right. Sorry, All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for the report, folks. We appreciate it. And with that, we are finished with our presentations and we're ready to move on to old business. The first item of old business is the issue of compensation and release that I addressed in my remarks. Um, I have suggested a motion in the chat that reads Connecticut State Senate supports Connecticut State that should be leadership or management, oversee and administer compensation and release for senators upon receipt of the updated data from Senate. As I shared with you earlier, I have uh, sent a, a simple three question update, update to find out the status of each senator. And at the conclusion of this meeting, hopefully by 245, I would like to transmit that data to President Maduco so that they can then take the lead on compensation and release and it no longer becomes an issue of equity being managed at each of the campuses. So if there is a motion to that effect and a second, we can discuss. It's Nicola, I make a motion to accept or Thank you. to. Is there a second? Sandra Vitale, I'll second it. Thank you, Sandy. Are there any questions, comments, or thoughts, concerns? Alan. Thanks, Elle. I'm just curious how extensive this is. I know that um, on our campus, um, I mean, I, I, have, I have not received a contract or not being compensated um, for release time. Uh, some some people serving on SDCs are interestingly. And it, I don't know what is happening. Wildly, it varies wildly, Alan. From some some a couple of people, a couple of people receive both compensation and release in different forms. Uh, but it it was less than five. Less than five people had this issue settled after the first survey. One campus attempted to address it wholesale and it created a payroll problem. And I don't know what the result of that has been. So that was the impetus for this new survey and to get the, the updated data into the hands of President Maduco's cabinet so that they can follow up on it. Okay, thanks. Yes, sir. Um, who is next? Roberta, I think, and then Miguel. Thank you. I was just going to say that I, I'd like to um, make sure that our leadership understands that not everyone um, can have an additional contract if they teach additional, like if for time, full time people are also teaching, they can't have an additional contract. And so they would need release time. So it'll be a little bit different for almost every person, I imagine. So I just wanna make sure that they understand that. Um, and what release looks like to some people and some campuses may look very different to others. You know, like I've been told, well, you can take an hour to go to that meeting. That's not a problem. <laughs> like, that's great, but I still have all this work to prepare for the meeting. And then, of course, students to see that meeting. So 
That's just I my think thought. That, Roberta, that is precise. The, the, those nuances and how it gets applied is exactly why it has been so difficult to execute. Yes. Um, and uh, Maya and Anne and Dr. Maduco participated fully in, in a really good conversation with the executive council. So we're really hopeful, but it is all of those nuances that makes it particularly challenging. Yeah. Okay. That's why we're asking for CT State to manage this as opposed to each campus. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Miguel? Yeah, um, it, it's, it, it's a very complex issue. And um, I think that this makes sense. Uh, I, I would have a caveat, and I don't know if it's necessarily a, an amendment to the motion, um, but I would hope that the consultation between uh, the CT state leadership um, uh, and, and uh, at, least at a minimum, the executive committee continue, because I think it's important that it be a back and forth dialogue. Um, it's also my understanding that um, there seems to be a back and forth between what CT state late leadership expects and what the senior levels of labor relations are saying can be done. Um, and so uh, I don't know whether we we're going to need to uh, make sure that labor relations is, are also involved in these discussions. I'm guessing yes, some way, somehow at some point, but the underlying concern is I want to make sure that the unintended consequence of this motion isn't that um, CT state assumes control without being able, uh, without us being able to continue the dialogue. So let me assure you, Miguel, that um, under no circumstances would we offload this to CT State. Uh, CT State leadership has been more than more than accommodating in meeting with us, and I'm and I am confident we'll continue to be supportive and it will remain an ongoing dialogue. So thank you. And, and if that were to stop, Miguel, I would certainly share that with the Senate, and at that time we would choose to act differently. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I worry about that only because you know you might like myself, we're both shrinking violence and hesitate to make our opinions known. So, you know. Very good. Are there any further comments before we move this to a vote? Uh, Stephen. I don't really know if it's like a comment or question per se, but uh, as like a GPA one and thinking about it from like a staff point of view, like I always feel like when we're told to do committees or things like this, that it's not necessarily like a compensation thing rather than something that we do in order for us to look better when we go to like for promotion and stuff like that for when we go in front of our unions. And so I guess I'm just curious from like the staff view of it, like. Is there like a competition that we should be having? Is there like in terms of like committees and the differences between faculty and how these things get distributed? So, Stephen, I'm going to take that question and and assign it to the vice president for CCPs and ask that he initiate a conversation to better understand that complexity. John, do, do you see what St the issue that I think Stephen and Miguel are both raising, Roberta, too? Um, and is that a conversation that you can manage with CCPs? I've lost John in my, there you are. Oh, I think John's frozen. Oh, there you are, John. You're not referring to John Fiorello, right? Yes, I'm talking to you. Oh, <clears throat> um, I think you have me confused with somebody else because I don't, I don't do that. CCP. Are you the vice president for CCPs? CCPs. What's CCPs? Community College Professionals. Oh. Staff. Staff. Sorry. Yes. Not the nomenclature we use here. <laughs> Sorry. Um, this issue came up in our conversations um, with Maduka and Maya. Uh, it's a concern that uh, people have, but I think like it was mentioned earlier, because it depends on the roles that people have and whether or not they're able to take compensation or not. Like, I think we just have to have a continuing discussion and like, um, I'll mentioned earlier with them coming back and saying, here's at least a 1st step of what we would offer. It gives us a chance to have a dialogue back and forth and maybe negotiate that a little bit. There is some concern from 
<clears throat> some of the folks um, representing the CT state that this is already um, unique and not necessarily something that's seen across all sorts of colleges across the US. Um, so that's another issue that we're going to try and dive into it and better understand. Um, but I'm, I'm sure that we all want to see this um, applied in a way that makes sense, whether or not uh, it's for people that are staff or people that are uh, faculty. So, John, I'm going to ask that um, between our next meetings that you I capture or that you identify and capture through through email uh, some of the concerns and nuances of staff so that we can make sure that we're addressing those. Sure. Thank you. All right, uh, if there's no further, is there any further discussion? Okay, if you support this motion, please vote yes by raising your hand now. If you support, th support this motion, please vote yes by raising your hand now. John, how many yeses do we have? We're at 30. I believe that is the proper number of senators. Okay, everybody, uh, lower your hands. Patrick, you're the last hand up. Very good, thank you, sir. Are there any objections? No objections. Are there any abstentions? Very good. This pa vote passes with unanimously. Thank you, folks. Now we are moving on to Connecticut, Connecticut state policies. We are finishing, hopefully finishing our work uh, with Amy Feast. Amy, are you here today? I am. I'm, I just got to Middlesex. They're doing an amazing uh, poster con contest, a uh, poster convocation for their honor students. And I'm really excited to be here, but I'm logging in for this and then I'm going to pop over to that. So, Amy, tell me where you are. Were there any remaining open issues or have you taken our feedback and implemented it? And are we ready to vote on these remaining issues? Well, the only one that I'm concerned about, and I, I went through what the remaining of your issues were, and I could definitely incorporate them. They're they're pretty simple. The definition of a credit hour, um, I think we may we may need to table that one only because the CBA does define it as 50 minutes, and the U.S. Department of Education defines it as one hour. So we actually have a disconnect between those very important things, which is hard to reconcile with a policy, um, in my opinion. Amy, how does the, the, the Carnegie unit define it? How is it defined in the, by the Carnegie unit? I, believe, know? It's, I, I, I believe it always has been one hour in the Carnegie unit. I can do a little research on that. I, I to be honest, I didn't think about looking at that. I was I was equally confident that it was the 50 minutes. So um, with the exception of the credit hour, the remaining items are ready for a vote. So I will ask for, Roberta, were you? Thank you, I'm sorry. I just wanna be certain we're, we're, you're talking about the remaining items that we have not previously voted on. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank we're, you. We're going to start with with 3.3, 3.35 multiple. I think we're missing a word there. So I'm not going to ask for a vote on that one until we get a name for it. Multi but I will. It's, it's multiple degrees. It's the granting of multiple degrees. Multiple degrees. Okay. Well, so Let's really see. quickly, we are going to. We're going to pause on 3.3.3 .3 .3 semester credit hours just to following the agenda appropriately. So 
Oh, for the notes. Correct. For the minutes. Okay, so hold on. Yes, sir. Okay. So Al, it looks like the Carnegie, I mean, I'm just looking very quick online right now. I need to do a, an actual looking, but the U.S. Department of Labor and the Carnegie hours minute that Carnegie hours seem to not be incongruent, which is probably a problem that's bigger than us sitting here. We'll just need to make a determination how CT State wants to define it because there's, do we follow the U.S. For the Department of for, for the obvious reasons. Yes. yes. It, it's Nicola. I just dropped something in the chat and it's from the Association of Community College Trustees and it says, Akarni, it's 50 minutes. So, so yeah, I, I'm going to ask that we table that. Um, and, and I'm going to, I'm about to, to tax my tech issues. I am going to share screen with the policies. But, uh, Nick, I need you to monitor the agenda and make sure that we are moving through it. Okay. So. Amy, can you provide me with 3.3.5, the actual title for the new minutes of multiple what? It's actually just the board of trustees. It's under degrees and it's a subset and it says multiple. So it's like a subset of a bigger category. It is actually just called multiple, but it does say a student may earn a second associate degree under the following circumstances. It defines how you can earn a second degree or multiple degrees. Okay. So but technically it's, it's that's the language, the... that's the language written that we would keep for the minutes. So based on how the BOR wrote it. Right. Okay. So Al, I'm going to leave that like that for the minutes, just because I can make a notation maybe that the BOR, yes. a BOR title or something there. So we don't think that there's a missing word again next time. I that would be that useful. Sense. Okay. Th thank I got you. It. I got it. Were were there no changes or concerns related to this one? I don't see any comp. Okay, nope, there aren't. There aren't. So is there is there a motion to accept this policy? This is Alberta. I move to accept policy uh, BOT policy three point three point five as written. Thank you. May I ask a question, Elle? Yes, Mayor Dodd. Um, in the, it says uh, in a different curriculum at the community college, uh, seeing that we're going towards CT State, should that be like a, at a different campus? The fourth line in the uh, fourth column, the student who already holds an academic degree. That's the old. Oh, that, it's an old one. Okay, okay, got it. Yeah, that's the justification. The proposed language that we're looking on is is the one that says a student may earn a second associate degree under the following circumstances. Okay. Thank you, partner. Thank you. No, no problem. It's Nicola. I second the motion. So, John, uh, because I ha I'm screen sharing, I can't see if there are any hands. So, if there are, if there is discussion, can you please? Make sure that we progress through that. Yep. No hands are raised right now. Okay, very good. We're going to move on to voting. All those in favor of it? Actually, let oh, me try this. Board, point of order. I don't think we had a second. So this is Alan. I will second this. Uh, I, I thought we did, but okay. I thank you. We did. Yep. Yeah, Nicholas seconded. Okay, my bad, sir. No, no worries. Um. Are there any objections to accepting this? Angelo? No hands are raised. Are there any objections or abstentions? No hands are raised. Okay, very good. We have accepted this item. We're going to move on to item 3.51. Amy, how did you respond to the comments for this section? So, this I, I, yep, absolutely. So, I'll, I'll start with the easiest one. We are still working on the form. We don't have an incomplete form yet. We will need to, that won't need to be. We will have it done soon, but we really don't need it until 
next semester because nobody will be requesting a, an incomplete for CT State until the end of the fall semester. So that will be coming, but it will be a very simple form, sim a very similar to what's used right now at each of the individual colleges because it's, it is a campus based form. So that is not done yet. Um, the I do see this the statement need to add Dean of Academic or Faculty Affairs. I'm I'm not that's not a title. So I wasn't quite sure what that meant. It says need to add Dean of Academic or Faculty Affairs in all policies. It's it's the Dean of Students and Faculty, the Dean of it's this it the, the Dean of Academic Affairs would be the CT State Dean. Is that what we want to no. add? No, Amy, it was in reference to some schools are going to have a dean of students and a second dean for academics. The larger schools that were given permission won't have that dean of students and faculty role. So we were trying to identify that. And I, I guess I'm going to just defer to Maya only because I am not sure where those conversations led. Is, is the title going to be no. dean of academics or dean it of faculty? Not, it's not dean of academics, it's dean of faculty. That's so what I thought. Of, there's, a, there's a dual dean of students and faculty. There'll be a dean of faculty and an associate dean of faculty, depending on which campus. But it's a dean of faculty is the campus based dean. The academic deans are going to be the statewide deans. So we can, I mean, we can, I think my opinion is keeping it the campus dean of students and faculty or their designee kind of allows it to be the dean of faculty, the dean of students and faculty, the associate dean of faculty, without having to get into all of those different different positions, but I defer to if you all would like something different. I think because of different campuses and how people interact with one another, we need to designate the different titles. I'm sorry. Just realize this is the one thing I'm just going to stress to this committee, the more Specific, we put these things into policy it means we have to go back to the board every time we change titles. So, if we choose in a year to change titles on the campuses, they will have to go back and redo all of the policy at the board level. That's 1 of the reasons we're trying really to be when we're looking at creating these new policies. We just don't want it to be something where we constantly have to go back to the board when we make administrative changes like titles. I, again, I defer to all of you, but just realize that could mean that if we do decide to change those titles, the policy needs to change. If I, I know that there's some hands, but just to clarify, since I was maybe not clear a moment ago, if you had a campus that had a sole dean responsible on the faculty side, it would be a dean of faculty. If you have a campus that's a medium sized campus, it would be a dual dean of students and faculty and a, perhaps an associate dean of faculty. So I think you could capture them all by simply saying the campus dean of faculty or their designee, because that would automatically trickle down to a campus dean of students and faculty or a campus associate dean of faculty. So the the sort of the, the top rung in that group would be the campus dean of faculty. Alan and then Miguel for some comments. Thanks. Well, uh, Maya, your um, suggestion makes sense. I was going to simply say that. Since we do know there are the two titles that we're going to have now, one is Dean of Students and Faculty and the other is Dean of Faculty. So my suggestion was to just list the two of those. But um, if you think saying just Dean of Faculty would cover every all the uh, relevant positions, I support that as well. That's right, yeah, thanks. I was gonna say something different. I, I actually disagree uh, slightly uh, with you, Maya. I, I don't know. Because if you do capital D Dean of faculty, that's a specific position. My suggestion was going to be in a similar vein to see, say, lowercase academic Dean parenthesis, e.g., or just even you don't need the parenthesis, so e.g., Dean of faculty, Dean of faculty and, stu uh, and students. Um, so you're saying it's the academic Dean for a campus, right? And oh, and, and sorry, the word campus as well. So a campus academic dean example, dean of faculty, dean of faculty and students. So you're you're defining it as the person in charge of the academic side of the house on the campus, um, and that allows you to have the associate dean of faculty. You know, it allows you to have anybody who is in charge with charged with that responsibility. Just to, again, I know this might seem like semantics, but it really is an important distinction. The academics curricular oversight are the statewide deans 
And so it's important that as we go into the CT state vernacular, the campus curriculum, that those, those issues roll up to the statewide deans from department chairs. And so the campus deans are the ones managing faculty affairs, but not specifically curricular affairs. And so that's why the word academics is a little tricky. So it's trying to be as broad in this, you know, trying to keep the language of the board policy as broad as possible. What you're trying to say here is you're not looking for multiple people to have to sign off on this. This would be a single individual. So if you list multiple names, that might be misinterpreted to think that all of those people that the campus does have a, a, a dual dean and an associate dean or a single dean with an associate, then who do they both have to do it? So that was the, the spirit of my comments okay. to indicate one person or their designee who's superseding and overseeing faculty affairs. No, I, and I think that's a, that's a, and I appreciate that distinction because that's an important, you're right, that is an important distinction. I was trying to come up with a catch all phrase. Um, because I'm not, I, I just, I, I'm, I'm reluctant to say Dean of faculty because that I feel like that. You know, maybe faculty Dean, I know that sounds silly, but lowercase faculty, I, I don't know, but we, we can figure that out. We don't need to, you know, belabor the point. Amy. Just a, a point of, of interest at 1. In 1 conversation, and I have it. As a note that we had a conversation, I don't have the notes of who said it. Everything from a student may request um, an incomplete um, all the way down is is really more procedure. And somebody suggested that we actually just scrap it all and keep the, the content much shorter. It was I think it was a comment that was made in a different version of this document that had been up earlier. It may be the other one that was in the folder that we had when we did not have them side by side. But there was a comment made that maybe we take out a lot of this. My notes have us actually potentially taking out, um, taking it out so that, I'm sorry, the wrong, wrong part, not from a student may request, then the next paragraph after, any faculty member may assign all the way down through, um, all the way down through, then starting the next one with students with an incomplete. Um, and getting rid of the procedure and just keeping the policy smaller and cleaner, that would also kind of not put the information into a board policy on the who. It's more of the what is the purpose of an incomplete. It would certainly clean it up. So if you yeah, if you went from where your cursor is right now and highlight up to where it says any faculty member that assigns an incomplete and you take that all out, if you just highlighted that, and then that would that would clean up the policy a lot and would not get into the details of what goes on the form nor the details of who signs off, but that would be on the form and in the procedure. So I can't do this a strike through here unless somebody can tell me how to do that with a. Amy, you, sorry. Roberta has a question. Go ahead, Roberta. Thank you. I'm sorry. Amy, the one piece in that whole area that I feel like we should document as a part of the policy is that if, if the faculty member agrees to the incomplete and the student does not complete the, the assignments, right, does not finish the incomplete, the work rather, um, that the grade will revert back to the original grade. Good point. I think that would cover us. Yeah. So, so Amy, at, at this point, I'm wondering if, let me stop sharing for just a minute, folks. Um, I'm wondering if a, a good way forward is to ask Amy to, to do the revision yep. and maybe bring back the, the clean versions. Yep. Um, is that acceptable for, I think we have five more. Could, yeah. could you make those changes? And then if the earlier you send them, Amy, We'll get a few final comments and hopefully be able to expedite these at the next meeting. Is that reasonable? It is reasonable. I don't know, though. I think there the, the some of the other ones that are lower that are all included on this list did, did not have substantial comments. It's up to you if you want to work on those or if you would just prefer to I can work on all of them and send them back as a group of five or six. Uh, Roberta, I see your hand. I I apologize. That's old. Oh, okay, Nick. Uh, Kristen came up first. Oh, 
Hi, uh, it's Kirsten. I was just wondering if maybe we could just take a quick look at the other BOT policies um, and see if there's a, a lot of um, wording there that needs more attention or if we can maybe support what's written and not have to carry that over to the agenda next month. Yeah, I was I was working on navigating back when I when I stopped comments here. So let me see. Nick, I know your hand was next. Do you is it okay if I if I find the no, next was, I was gonna say exactly what she just said, so I'm good. Okay. I'm writing it right. up for you, Amy. Or at least I'm trying. So we're gonna table three point five point one to next meeting with revisions and then I we can move on. Yes, sir. Okay, got you. Thank you. Amy, are you able to respond to, it looks like Roberta and I had comments on this one. Yeah, so this one, um, we do not know if we will be bringing BOR 1.19 through. We have not even looked at it yet. We have not looked at the newer BOR policies yet. We've only been focused on the BOT. So I don't have an okay. answer if that will be coming forward in the future. Um, and you wanted to put, um, and or designee or and des or designee, we, we this is the same issue that was ab above the dean of students and faculty, dean yep. of academic affairs, or the designee. So what we can we can do the dean of students and faculty for the faculty member or dean designee. Yeah, what I was asking is the designee part. Are is that referring to the faculty member or for the dean? The dean. Okay, that was just that clarification. Yep. So we can basically leave this as written since we're not going to put the Dean of Academic Affairs in there. Is that correct? I, I believe so, but okay. I think there are hands. No hands. Okay, who's next? No, there are no hands. Mm. Is there a motion to accept this policy? Oh, Three point from Adam five. now. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Al. Um, so again, going back to this point, we ha we do have. If it, I think that if we do use the term dean of students and faculty, that position is only um, relevant to certain campuses. There is also a position of dean of faculty that is going to be, I know, at our campus and maybe some of the other larger campuses. So, if we're going to be specific, then I think we should use both both of those titles. If we want to find a more generic term, that's fine. But if we're going to be specific, I think that we should list them both. Amy, were you going to find a more generic term that applied to all of these? Yes, I'll work with Maya and we'll come up with with something. The, the camp, maybe the, the campus based. Academic officer. Mm, not, not an oh. academic officer. That's the problem. Oh, oh yeah. Um, the campus based dean of faculty. Or because. As Maya say, said, it, it covers both. If, but if, if you say campus lowercase faculty. Capital D dean. Then it implies the dean. The dean, the actual dean. Who is responsible for faculty, right? Whether it is the dean of faculty and students, or whether it is the dean of faculty, or whether it's an associate dean of faculty. That is true. I think the lower case will take care of it, and that will make it generic. So say that again, Miguel, because I'll drop it in the comment. Uh, I'll, I'll yeah, I'll write it down. Or you could have something like the campus dean responsible for faculty affairs. Because remember, this is board language, so you don't want to necessarily have to bake, bake in the job titles into the board language. Say that again, Maya, the campus dean. Campus you dean responsible for faculty affairs. I added it to the comment for you, Amy. Thank you. Perfect. I'm making notes in my master document as well. That, that, that might work. All right, so we're waiting on that change. Also, that moves us on to 3.5. Three insurance. Right. And there's only one question on here. Um, 
Oh, should this be required for cheerleading? Oh, oh what? sorry, I didn't see the cheerleading question, but it, does this mean each of the CSUs? So we, we are, we are meaning this, um, we are changing this from our board of trustees policy because nothing it, it currently exists at the board of regents level for inter, intercollegiate. And we want it to just be encompassing of um, all of our colleges. We could say, we could say colleges or universities or campuses, and that would cover the CSUs and all of our campuses within CT state. If, if that's what you mean by does colleges mean each of the CSUs and or is it suggested by campuses of? It's, I mean, it's just CT State needs to have the insurance. Okay. Well, if it's, I, I wanted, this is Roberta, I wanted to make sure that we included the intramural and some of the, um, you know, some of the co curricular activities that our students engage in yeah. are, there's more risk, you know, like the ski club, outdoor recreation club that's, Hiking mountains, things so, of that nature. I want to make sure it's all encompassing. So now that I understand what you're going to ask, mm -hmm. what you're asking, yep. um, let me just make sure that is the intent of what, what insurance we actually have to carry. So I'm going to ask you to let me investigate that a little more now that I understand what you mean. Thank you. I don't want to put into a policy that we're going to carry insurance for something that we don't intend to carry insurance for. Sure. I, you're right. We should be, but let me just make sure. I am now looking for policy 3.31, folks. Was that in a different document, Amy? It should it should not be. It should be all in the same document. I only sent you one with everything. Um, I, it's with there. Why is not it here? It goes 3.91 is where I am now. 392. Is that the repeat policy that seems to have lost its um its number? No. Three no. point three point three one is the second to the last on the last page. Thank you. Yeah. And, and these are actually numbered the way that the board numbers them. I put them in the same order that are in the handbook. It it isn't always logical to me. I, I had just I I quit sharing because I was having to scroll so much. I didn't. Okay, so we're at three point. Three one president's authority to validate an award. I I do think it is Connecticut State Community Colleges and Universities because Charter Oak is also a college. That was the only comment. Okay. Uh, is there a is there a motion to accept item three point three one? It's Nicola, I make a motion to accept. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Alan. I, I think it was Alan. It was Joe, so bye, Joe. Oh, thank you, Joe. Uh, any discussion? Very good. All those in favor of accepting 3.31? Please raise your hand. All those in favor, please raise your hand. John, remember, I can't see anything on the uh, count, so I need you to take care of that, please. 26, 27, 28. You can add mine for whatever the count is, John. And what's the final tally? 30. 30. It, uh, the motion passes. There are 30 of us. Very good. Thank you, folks. Brian, for your minutes, that was 3.31, President's authority to validate an award. Yep, I'm good to go. I just need clarification on 5.3 uh, student insurance. Is that coming back to, is that tabled and coming yes. back with the language adjustment? I need to go Correct. to Carrie. I need to go to Carrie Kelly and really double check that. That was submitted by another group, not my group. Um, and I need to. I'm not sure if she vetted that language, and I want to make sure it was included or not included intentionally. So I don't have that answer. I want to get the right answer for you. Okay, Amy, your name's on it. 
I'm good with that. <laughs> All right, and our final well, item for policies today, folks, is uh, also does not have any comments. It is English as a second language, 3.37. Motion to accept as written. We have a lot of hands up. Or propose, um, rather. Or, yeah. We have a lot of hands up, but I think they might be left over from voting. All right, I will. Let's do this. Uh, please speak up if you have a comment or concern. Items for discussion. Santua. Maybe what was that, John? Uh, Santua's got his hand up. Okay. Uh, Betty, after that, Peter. All right, now we're down to Betty. Sorry, that was from before. Okay. Uh, Peter? Oh my gosh, mine too. This is ridiculous. Sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah, this was from before. Ignore me. Okay. This is crazy. All right. Here, here's Lauren. what I'm going to ask, folks. Are there any objections to accepting 3.37 as presented? Are there any objections? Said, Miguel? Yeah, objection. I object. And I know Hannah had her hand up to, to comment. Yes. Lisa, I'm terribly sorry because um, because of this information initially that I could not serve on two um, committees on these two committees. I I did not become aware of this. This seems to be essential. Uh, could you fill me in on the gist of what this is? Because I don't have access to this document. I think I mean I, I may be wrong. Hannah, this is. Just so you know, this is taking outdated board of trustee policy and just um, updating it for CT state and to um, eventually retire the BOT handbook, which is woefully old and out of date. So we did keep um, the same, the same um, spirit of what the BOT language was, which is in the column that says the Connecticut Community College System shall award. That's what it says now. And we changed it to within the same number of the same spirit to the Connecticut State Community College shall award credit. And we just wanted to make sure that we kept it within what the language that's applicable to the way we, we're currently operating. Okay, let me read through it for one minute while you keep discussing, if you don't mind. Miguel? Hey, Amy, can I just ask, uh, is this saying that ESL students are getting credit for ESL, or would this would an ESL student be able to use ESL courses as a substitute for a foreign language required? I guess that's my question. Yes. Yes, and that has gone through a long, long process. Of um, yeah, we we've. we've go, and, oh. My under my understanding is the board policy is very clear in the first part of this that levels one, two, and three cannot be counted towards graduation requirements, just as they never have. So we, we wanted to um the intermediate through advanced levels, we wanted to be specific. And we've also said that I don't believe that they can use them for foreign language requirements, but we're using the same um parameters as the number of applicable credits that we have for foreign language credit limits now. And I'm, I know Mike is on this call, yeah, Mike Stefanowicz. Amy, Amy, Amy the, the second, really it's just that students that are enrolled in advanced ESL courses can count those as a foreign language. If they, okay, yes. it is a second language or third or fourth. So if a student, if a degree program like liberal arts has a foreign language requirement and a student enrolls in the upper levels of ESL, those count. Those levels of ESL also count as a foreign language at UConn. That was partly why this policy came about. It does not mean that an ESL student is granted foreign language credit. It means that if they take the courses, they count as foreign language courses. Miguel. Yeah. Can I add to that briefly? I'm sorry, Miguel, you had your hand up before me though. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Because I yes. because I know you you have expertise in this. Yes, so uh, I think what we ended up with was that the upper levels, exactly intermediate to high advanced, can count towards um, um, 
liberal arts and I think there's only room for eight credits basically for foreign language. If they take those advanced reading writing courses, they could count as those. Um, I think the lower levels, what used to be 132, 022 is anyway, the, the lowest level does not count towards anything. It it does qualify for financial aid, but the, the lower level um, could potentially be used as an open elective. I think that is what was discussed, and that seems also what um, other colleges seem to accept as transfer. We just had someone who was going to Stony Brook College, and they took some of those as open electives. But that was um, the old board policy, and and that is what we also agreed on. Okay, now. and I don't want to belabor the. I guess my concern is the effect on foreign language courses and enrollment themselves, um, because to me English is English, and I understand that ESL students are learning English as a foreign language, but the, I, as, as a foreign language instructor, that's sort of where I'm, I'm coming from. I have a concern about enrollment. And I wonder whether this may, maybe should be referred to, uh, for the, to the curriculum Congress, not for approval, but for discussion. Um, so anyway, I, I don't want to get bogged down with this because we have a lot to do. But well, let's uh, let's take a moment for Angelo, who's had his hand raised, and then we'll come back to you, Hanalar. Hi guys. Also for for languages, I just was in touch with the uh, chair, uh, Jamilet, uh, who is a co-chair of the ESOL for language CDC committee, and also chair of the uh, foreign language consortium, and she's surprised. So am I to see the intermediate level. Uh, is part of this language that was never discussed according to our uh, records and I like to table uh, this paragraph so that the ESL colleagues and, and us can we further discuss this item and we're going to be able uh, to report at our next meeting as this language is showing right now it's not something we would agree but do realize this is the same language that's has been in place for Decades through the BOT know. policy. We didn't know. Can we? Can we I'm go? Seeing get... this, as I said, we agreed to give credit to higher level courses, mm -hmm. but not intermediate. That is what I'm uh, been discussing with Jamilet right now. Um, Angela, can I jump in here? I think there may be a misunderstanding because only the top two levels would count towards the foreign language, and I think that has always been. The case, the intermediate levels could potentially count as open electives. I would also it want say to. That. Sorry, it doesn't. And say we that. have to change it to that because that is what was agreed on, and that is also what um, the old policy allowed us to do. The um, um, so it could the the intermediate level. What was one forty two could potentially count as a. Um, humanities elective, but the, the, I, I don't see any harm. I, I don't know if you do, but I don't see any harm in actually uh, tabling this uh, uh, three point three point three seven for the time being. Mm. Have a nice discussion I, about it and uh, get back to that. Can we? Can I just clarify one other thing, Angelo? I understand your concern, but I. Th I don't think that this would cannibalize. It has never cannibalized the foreign language credits at all. The the utmost students might do is clap out of a foreign language. Um, I don't know that that is uh, great. This helps ESL students that need the support to graduate, to actually use courses towards graduation. What I do wish for, and we're pushing for that also, would be to have um, um, a bilingual certificate that would encourage particularly heritage speakers to take a higher level Spanish course, for instance. So, because some of them may be orally proficient, but not so much in writing, that would be a great value. And we are thinking about that. But if we could change that language to the upper two courses, that is what it has always been, has been like that for 30 years. I personally would not recommend to bring that back and have that discussed and reopened for discussion. This has gone all the way up to uh, various 
committees and um, we have an objection from the uh, uh, CDC co chair to this language and also uh, from the consortium, from foreign language consortium as well. So, so point of clarification. This, and I think again, I don't see the harm in further <laughs> discussing it. Thank you, Angela. Point of clarification. Do we have a motion and a second on this? I motioned for Bernadette. We never and did we, we never have a second? second. We, we didn't have a second. We didn't have a second as no. to the as written. So, yep. Okay. We have some My folks who have their hands raised if we want to talk to them, or we can address you know the motion to table. If there's a second, so so we do have a motion to table. Is Miguel? Where are you? you there you are in the room. If we have a motion to table, we vote on that before we. You actually need a second first for the for the underlying main motion, so, um, which is Roberta's motion, and then afterwards you can get you can take on the motion to table. But if we don't have a second to the original motion, then, then it the could die right now. Correct. Right. The motion so without a second, this motion will die. First, uh, John, go ahead, Hannah. Is there a way to amend the motion to with the necessary correction that only the top two levels can count to what as foreign language credit? Um, Angela, would that be would that be? Yeah, it's sufficient for you. To be honest with you, it's not a decision that I can I feel like making. I think it should be a collegial uh, decision, including if all the parties involved. I think that would be the fair thing to do, since it involves so many people. Uh, so um, again, I don't see any harm. But in we are still it. we're still and looking for and agree we're on still something. looking for a second to the motion. Or for the I, motion to I'll be. Second, I'll, I'll second the second motion Roberta's, for the purpose of discussion. I was first, Miguel. <laughs> I'll second Roberta's motion, and okay, then I would go. also like to vote on table. Oh, I had another comment, but who, uh, uh, John? I don't know the so order of speakers. For for commenting on this issue, we have Maya, then Kirsten, then Roberta. Yeah, I just, I don't mean to um, interject, but as a reminder, this is an existing board policy and Ella, I'm not sure I don't have the language in front of me, but if you could just bring it up one more time. Does it say Connecticut colleges and universities or does it say Connecticut community colleges? Give me just a second because I have. Because again, this is this is established board policy. The the proposed change is to change the name to CT State instead of the community colleges. It is not a substantive change. Thank you. If if there's a question about opening this up to changing the the actual policy, mm -hmm. that would be a substantive change that would require some significant rationale and discussion before the board. I think it's the next one down. Sorry about that. Okay, so this does say community colleges. All right, that that is good because a that would be an issue to take to your university partners if it did. Um, but again, I just want to make sure people are clear. Whether you like it or not, this is already current policy that the institution should be compliant with. What the questions being raised is maybe people weren't aware that this is current policy and aren't happy about it, but this is current policy. Just making sure we're on the same page. All right, go ahead, Hannah, uh, Roberta, and then Hannah, Laura, and then Alan. Thank you. Um, I, I, what I was going to say is basically the same thing that Maya said is that this is the current policy that we have. We just changed. It's just shorter, but the reality is that if we make students that are bilingual, trilingual, et cetera, take additional classes. And additional foreign language classes, you're talking about impeding on their financial aid. They won't be able to finish their programs. So there's a lot more to it than just, you know, forgive me, but protecting our turf. We want to make sure that we can get our students through our programs and that they can do so in a way that they're not going to be overly exerted and have to pay, have a lot of financial consequences. All right, Hannah Lohr, and then just in the interest of time, um, we should probably see if we're going to move on a motion to table or we're going to address the original initial motion, right? I want to I want to uh, uh, reinforce that as well. This has been board policy 
for about 30 years. Mm -hmm. And the fact that people were not aware of it must mean that it has not caused a problem. We're not trying to invade on the turf of foreign languages. We are very close with the foreign language programs and, and work with them closely all the time. So I, I'm still not happy. I do not think that we should, you know, roll back this policy that has helped our students to graduate. Alan. Thanks. Um, can I, could you clarify uh, how many, this says intermediate to advanced levels, but then uh, Hanalore, you were saying that, well, it's only the top two levels. So how many levels of ESL courses are there and which courses would not be covered by this policy and which courses would be? So there are five levels. The two lower levels do not fit in this category. Um, there are only eight credits accepted anyway. So usually it would be the 152, which is the second highest or the top level. We would only consider a lower level if the student, for instance, skipped forward. And there is a way to use to leverage that that high intermediate level. But as a rule, it was 152, 192 that have been able that we the students have been able to use. Um, Would it be possible to address the concerns expressed here and tweak the language of this? Because this sounds like, you know, I think beginning, intermediate, and advanced, I think of three levels, but you're saying there are five. So could the language yeah. say the top two levels? Uh, the of the top two position? levels count towards foreign language, but I think as humanities, the, the 132, so 132, the lowest level doesn't count towards anything. It's it's seen as um, it qualifies for financial aid, but it doesn't count towards graduation. The next two levels can be uh, counted as open electives. The third level can possibly also be used as a humanities elective or LAS. Not every degree has a foreign language opening even or requirement. Sadly, I wish there was more uh, acknowledgement of foreign language needs, but um, so they can use those because it's humanity. Basically, foreign language is part of humanity is part of LAS, right? It fills those different boxes. But the reality has been that the students usually use this one course 152, possibly a piece of 192. And again, those students are very rarely inclined to then go back unless they just take a class with the skill they already have basically to get a good grade and, and move forward and not do too much work. So I- This, this says I, specifically foreign language credit. So that's why I was just thinking if we could, um, you know, just tweak the language about which yes. courses, which courses are included here, maybe that would assuage everyone's concerns. Thanks. If, if I may take that on and try to tweak that language to uh, to reflect this, we have a um, ESL council meeting and then send it back to um, the foreign language consortium. Some of our teachers are actually serving in both committees. I am also on the STC, um, but I I do not think we should take it upon ourselves to roll back policy or destroy policy that has helped students for 30 years. I don't think that's a good idea. Uh, Brian. <clears throat> so we have a motion to accept as written and seconded at this point. So do we actually have to vote on this and can we not change this with a second motion already on the as written? Well, I guess I would. I would like to move that we table it. I'd like to take Anilor's suggestion and appreciate that. There's a uh, I'm just wondering if we had a I second. We had a second to the as written. I'm sorry. Was there a second to Roberto's motion? Yes, there yes, was. There, okay. there was yes. a second. We now need to vote on this. So we need to vote on the motion, which is accepting it as written. If the motion fails, we can return this to Amy or revision and and ask yeah. that she work with the appropriate groups. So let's try the one more thing, if I may. I think it, if, it will be excuse fair. Excuse me, Angelo, give me just a minute, please. I have the floor. Thank you, sir. I thought you were so done. we will vote on this motion. If this motion passes, then we are finished. If this motion fails, we can return it 
along with the other policies for revision. Angelo, you have the floor for the final comment. I, I just, <clears throat> I was saying it feels a little uh, un unfair where the, the direct people involved in this issue uh, cannot be heard uh, by this body. The only thing I'm asking is postponing this vote to the next meeting. That's all I'm asking. Uh, the, the rest of the discussion about that's how it's been for 30 years and all that, why I respect it, we are starting a new system. We are starting fresh. So I think this is the opportunity to revise anything that some of us feel like I'd say disadvantages uh, to us. And a, the only thing I'm asking is to have a discussion with, with the ASL people. I'm not excluding anybody. So I'm we're going to go ahead and end debate, and, and I'm going to ask that we vote. So if you support this motion, and that is the policy as written, please vote yes. If you support this motion, and that is the policy as written, please vote yes. John, how many votes do we have there? 14. We have 14. Everybody put your hand down, please. Uh, yeah. I counted 16. No, I counted 14 as well. Okay. okay. Thank you. It appears all hands are down. If you oppose this motion, if you oppose this motion, please vote now. Opposing this motion will return it for review. If you oppose this motion, it returns it for review. John, how many do we have? 13. Another one had, there's another vote. There's an, so it's 14 to 14? Now it's 14. Hmm. Did we lose members? Because we had 30 at the beginning. Of, we had 30 voting members. Let me ask this. Go ahead and put your hands down and let's see if there were abstentions. Go ahead and put your hands down. Very good. Abstentions. There are, abstentions. There are three abstentions. Miguel, what do we do when the vote ties? Well, the math doesn't add up. Did we, no, did the math add up right? Because. We have 31. We've never had 31. We usually have 30, don't we? Yes, we, the math doesn't add up. Okay. And here is our first problem. Oh. Did somebody well, vote that question. wasn't a center. Okay. Just to answer your question, on a tie vote, it fails. On a tie vote, it fails? Yeah. Then it doesn't, then it doesn't map. No, we still, our, our vote still wasn't we, we had but one more had person vote, vote that shouldn't vote. A miscount somehow. Right. So, so folks, we, we have to do this. We have to vote again. And I will remind you that only senators <coughs> can vote. Only senators can vote. If you vote in favor of this motion as to accept the policy as written, please raise your hands now. I'm counting 14. 14, thank you. Please lower your hands. Sarah and Hanalore, your hands are still up. Allison, Sorry. there we go, thank you. If you oppose this motion and you wish to return it for revision and review, please raise your hand. If you oppose this motion and you wish to return it for revision and review, please raise your hand. I have 
14. <laughs> Please lower your hand. Yeah, we will ask for abstentions. 14 against 14. Please lower your hand, Sandra. Thank you very much, ma'am. If you abstain, please raise your hand. And we have two abstentions. There we go, 30. A tie vote fails. That means this will be returned to Mike. Mike Stefanowitz, did I see, didn't I see your hand pop up? I, I did raise my hand, right. I just want to clarify that that as a result of the merger, I believe all policies will have updated language. So what was proposed, the board can change on its own because it is their policy. Um, so if if people wish to revisit the policy, I put it in the comments. If people wish to change the policy substantially, that would need to come forward as a recommendation from this body. And there would need to be a rationale given to the board. Mo many of these policy changes are simply language name changes where the press that said the community colleges will do this in the future. It will say Connecticut state will do this. So I just want to be, be clear with everybody that. That you can table this issue and that's fine and take it up next month. I do think that the language will change no matter what from community colleges to Connecticut state. If that makes sense to folks. Um, if it didn't change, students might lose that, 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 that policy might end so and lost. students would not have the benefit of the policy that was in existence prior to it. 14 against 14. So what we're going to do now, folks, is I'm going to put us in recess for the next five minutes. There is a corruption. One of the, uh, the motion fails. It's and it from Angelo's. Uh, Angelo is yeah. unmuted. And there we go. I took care of that. Thank you, Merdan. So we're going to go into recess uh, for seven minutes at 150. We will come back together. If folks want to continue this discussion, um, hopefully Amy is still in the room. If there are minor modifications, we can have this conversation for what we do next on this issue. I will bring us back to order at 150 and then hopefully we can finish our agenda. Thank you folks. I'm just going to step away for a moment, but um, Roberta and I were, were chatting. We did in the chat for incomplete. I think we captured what everybody wanted. It's up to you if you want to look at it now or if you want to table it till next month. I don't have a strong preference, but in the chat, I think I captured what the change that was wanted to be made. But if I didn't, I'm more than happy to table it. Can can you uh, oh, so do you have access to the document right now? It's in, it's in the I, document. I put it in oh, the comment in the document yeah got it I, okay i will um for 3.5.1 thanks i will i will see if we can get back if we can navigate our way back backwards in the agenda if, if not it's okay i'm i'm going to um step off for a minute just to check out what's going on in this event and i will check myself back in in about five ten minutes okay thank you Amy, could you put it please also put it in the chat here because i do not have access to this document yet it won't be in the chat. It's too big. It we've been that's what we've been yeah, trying we've been to trying. do. <laughs> we've been going back and forth, and finally I said I'll put it in the document. It, but we'll share the screen in the document if we choose to to take a look at it. Can you put All a right. link to the document in the chat? If, if Lisa could get me into that folder, then I can also see it. Um, I I can try to do the link. Let me see. I put it right here and see if that works. Thank you. I don't think I don't think so, Amy. She has we'll to have work. access on the SharePoint. And um, Maya, Maya gave us a tutorial on the difficulty of using SharePoint. Hannah, yes. I don't I have permission to add you to the SharePoint. I think I'm in the SharePoint. I might just not be looking at the right oh, document. Okay, I can help you navigate SharePoint. So if you go to, let's see, you're on Connecticut State Shared Governance. Is that right? Yes, I think so. Okay, click on documents. Hold on one second. So if, if you're on Connecticut State Governance and then you go to Connecticut State Senate. I think I'm not in the right folder. Let's 
let me look. We don't have to do this in front of everybody. <laughs> Lisa, um, I'm in SharePoint, so I'm in SharePoint. That's so if you're in SharePoint, uh, you need to go click on the tile that is Connecticut NCC State Senate. Shared Senate. Governance. No, not NCC Senate, sorry. Oh, you found Senate? I have found the NCC Senate, which is not the right one. No, this is Connecticut State College I know. Senate. I'm trying to find it. See all. Ah, there might be more hidden. Ah, what is opening up? Shared governance. Correct. Okay. Once you open that folder, you should see a folder for Connecticut State College Senate. No, I see only direct documents like CT state policies. CT state policies. Uh, version so and so. Well, if, if you have gotten to Connecticut state policies for Senate review, do you have that? Do not, not yet. Okay. Yeah, I think it's I think it's an issue of access for you. Yeah, let me look. Let me look. Okay, I don't want to keep everybody here. Documents. Well, I need an action for the tie vote. So the tie vote fails. What's happening next? Is this going back to Amy for revisions? I heard a bunch of people saying they want to take a look at it. Yeah, we it 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 failed. So Amy will will go back. Um, it, it goes back to Amy. Okay. And and hopefully Amy will work with Angelo and Hannah more collectively to resolve the discrepancies. Okay. It, she she indicated a willingness to to do so. Gotcha. Okay. I'm gonna add it. I think it's just a misunderstanding. It's a misunderstanding, I think of but I but I do I think, think in, so. the, in the spirit of collegiality, I think we need to be on the same page. I don't think it's a misunderstanding, Hannah. I think it's something that the foreign language faculty didn't know about. And I think it's yeah. entirely possible that it has affected the upper levels of foreign language. Um, my my but my my problem is why is it being considered specifically a foreign language credit? Why is it considered an English credit? It's English as a second language. Why it's isn't it not. an English credit? Because it is a foreign language to them. It is a foreign language to them, but it is not a foreign language here, right? Ang English is the dominant language of the United States. So we can we can we can argue that back and forth. To me, what I would suggest is that we we table it this month, or or, or actually, well, it's already motion failed. So that over the next month, ESL Council meets with Foreign Language Consortium, and then come up with with a with a something that can pass next month in terms of the name change for Connecticut State versus. Um, the Connecticut Community Colleges, and B, propose a, a substantial policy change language, which is a longer term process. So we, we need to fix the name. We need to get that done. This is not going to go on. Um, okay, folks, it is 150 and I'm going to call the meeting back to order. What about the concepts of test? By oh. <laughs> I love that discussion that is happening in the chat. <laughs> um, where are we in the agenda, Brian? Please help me, sir. Oh, yes, we now, with a failed vote, move to the Academic Standards Committee discussion tabled from 324. Point of order. L, you said that we were going to continue the discussion on the on the, the on the motion on the item we were just discussing before we move forward. I did. If we chose to. Oh, oh, if we chose to. Right. Uh -huh. right. So, so, um, what I want what I want to do with that, Miguel, is is see if there is time remaining after we address C, D, and E. I want to see if there's time remaining after we address the other items, and then we will return to this if we have time, if time permits. Okay. All right, folks, who brought the, uh, Alan, 
am I am I recalling correctly that you brought the academic standards committee to our attention from the last meeting? Um, I know I addressed something about it. Yes, um, and I know our academic standards committee met subsequently and decided not to elect leadership for next year because they we don't know what's going on. So. Um, my concern was, you know, how are you going to have a, a, a statewide academic standards committee that would know the nuances of what's happening on a given campus? You could have an we we listened to ten great appeals. Um, nine were from uh, uh, nursing students. Um, now that's unusual, but imagine you know multiply that times twelve. And um, it could be quite problematic if there's only one academic standards committee statewide. So I just not sure how um, how Connecticut State envisions handling this, but um, it would be nice perhaps to have state policies that then are implemented on the campus level. That's my thought. Michael has a question. If I could just perhaps provide some some background, um, we did get a request from from a few folks, uh, a, a letter asking us about an academic standards committee. Um, as many of you know, I was involved in uh, developing the original governance model, and uh, certainly stayed tuned as as the new as the model was revised. Um, the original governance uh, group did not discuss an academic standards committee. Um, I know that at some colleges. Curriculum committees handle academic standards. At some colleges, it's called academic standards and curriculum. Um, at no point during that model, when we sent it out for public comment or um, received feedback um, on that, did, did we hear about academic standards? I don't mean to imply that it's not important or there should not be a committee. However, if it's a standalone committee, I think the governance model would need to be adjusted. Um, and there is not clear language about how to adjust the governance model. For instance, if there was going to be a curriculum Congress, a curriculum, a academic Senate and a standards committee. If it was a subcommittee of Congress or a subcommittee of Senate, or perhaps a shared committee with members from both. You know, that certainly could go forward, but I think it's a little bit of a conundrum because there's there's no method right now other than that the governance model said they would revisit it. You know, we would revisit the model. There's really no no method to make changes to it. I would think we would want to have both bodies vote to any major changes to the model. So I just wanted to share some of the background on that. I think academic standards is a great concept. I, at Manchester, where I work, they handle different issues than the curriculum committee. That is not something where I work, they handle both issues. But I think it would be important to define kind of the jurisdiction and the responsibilities of a standards committee. Are they hearing great appeals? Are they, at some colleges, they would establish, um, you know, uh, a great appeals process. Some of that is becoming more consistent statewide. Um, so just, just some background, I wanted everybody to know kind of where it came from and some of the history on it. Thanks. Thank you for that update, Mike. Uh, John, what's the order of hands, please? Uh, Peter, then Amy, then Roberta, then Nicola. Okay, I I believe last time uh, Julie Casper Roth from our campus NCC uh, brought up the idea that uh, we have a uh, statewide academic standards committee uh, here on this campus. Uh, the academic standards is is mostly concerned with policies and not so much with student appeals. Um, so, uh, you know, we wouldn't expect uh, hundreds of student appeals to be adjudicated with this committee. Um, I guess what we were looking to, to do is to set up a standing committee of the Senate. Uh, on our local campus, we have in our, our bylaws, uh, approximately 10 standing committees. Um, and they are under the jurisdiction of the Senate. And we thought that, that the academic standards would be a good standing committee for the statewide Senate. Obviously, we don't need a, um, a parking committee and a wellness committee and, and things like that. But um, 
we, we thought that the academic one might be reasonable. Um, I, again, we have no firm commitment to this at statewide level, but uh, we, we feel that something should be considered. Thank you, Peter. Amy? Amy? Step, I stepped away to hear a student presentation really quick and then stepped back and I saw a question in the chat when I came back about test by examination and club credit. I didn't know if it had been discussed while I walked away, but I just wanted to let you know that there is a group um, working on this. Um, Karen, um, Karen Heineck, the president of Quinnebog, and Joe, um, I'm sorry, Tom Cooley are leading that group. And there are, they are looking to develop some policy around this and they are looking for um, for us to do some procedure around it. So I just want to let you know it, it is something that is in process. So I, I just know the question was just in there about the, those two concepts. I just wanted to give an update on that. Thanks, Amy. Roberta? Thank you. Um, as I understand it, there is going to be a great appeals committee for each campus. Um, I was going to say, Brian or Amy, can you? Okay. Yes. Thank you. The great appeals, there, there is already a great appeals um, process that was been put to place and it is campus based. We, I think it would be almost impossible to have it to be a CT statewide committee. I think it would be, it would be overwhelming for that committee in my opinion. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank Nicola? you. Wouldn't the academic um, standards committee be a better placed as a standing committee under curriculum Congress? I have a question, Maya. Sorry, trying to find all the right buttons. I apologize. I just wanted to follow up on two things. One thing that Amy was mentioning about the CLEP and the test by examination. Um, the policy draft that the group led by Karen Heineck and Tom Coley, um, that is a draft and their intention is to bring it before this body in the coming academic year. So they're still in the initial stages talking with partners and high school partners and so forth drafting the, the, the language based on some research. So please be aware that this body is part of that, that plan. Um, in terms of the academic grade appeals, that is already an approved policy for CT State with the procedures that's already been out there. It's in the catalog, you can find it out there. Um, it's, it's right under the students' rights and responsibilities page of the catalog. It is campus-based. There is also an expedited process, for example, for clinical appeals, et cetera. So that's already been hashed out over the past year or two. Um, and so the third thing is that, yes, curricular matters should be under Congress, but I do think if there are policy matters related to the curriculum, that there should be some connection to this body. So it might be a shared type of connection, depending on the scope of what the purpose of that body would be for what it's worth. Thank you. Uh, Alan. Thanks. Um, Maya, I know you just said that um, the, the great appeal process was published, but it's not been communicated at all. Like our, our uh, on Gateway's campus, it's the Academic Standards Committee that deals with great appeals. And I'm sure it's different at different campuses, but no one has any idea. It's not been communicated to us what that process is or that there is a process or who oversees it. Um, is there a way that you could disseminate that information uh, so to the campuses so that we would be uh, prepared for the coming uh, academic year? So I, I hear you, and it sounds like perhaps it's not well known on your campus, um, and that can certainly we can we can draw attention to it again. But just to clarify, that was well shared and vetted a year ago when that process was taken through the APRC and SFASACC and the CCIC, getting campus feedback. And then when the catalog was made publish, it was made available to faculty back in September and October. All this stuff was in the catalog and we asked for feedback for many, many months. So um, it, it's possible and it's understandable that some things maybe did not come to the to, to your attention or to a campus's attention on the way. Um, and certainly we can we can redirect it, but there have been many, many opportunities along the way, but I know that there's a lot going on. So yeah, it, there's it, a lot going on and we're involved that we're involved with our own jobs and teaching and there's this barrage of information coming. And I'm, you know, I believe you that it's been vetted and and um 
published, but not specifically communicated saying, you know, this is the, you know, it's part of a much larger package of information, right? That you have to go looking for. And so um, that's, I'm just simply asking to, for, uh, to be directed to that. So in the catalog, just to, to your point, in the catalog for people out there, there's a student's rights and responsibilities page. And it's got the student code of conduct, Title IX, the great appeals, and some other things out there. Um, those are items that have been already approved in line for CT State. There are a few items that are still outstanding that we're waiting for the copy pending the decisions based from this body here. I just put it in the chat, by the way, the link. John, is there any further discussion? No one else has their hand raised. Is there a motion related to this discussion item? Very good. Thank you for your discussion, folks. It seems that there might be a time when Curriculum Congress and Senate have a joint subcommittee, but perhaps it is not now. So we'll move on in the agenda to discussion of college Senate inaugural photo. Um, Angelo, you, you introduced us to that idea. Do you have any thoughts on how we might um, advance that or if it is even possible? A Angelo? Okay. Uh, we're going to go ahead and move to the resolution from Capital Community College, uh, Senate Bill 1105. And then we'll return to Angelo and see. Can you guys hear me? Oh, Angelo, thank you, sir. Hey, I just uh, shut off the uh, Bluetooth. So I was saying, uh, I, I thought it would be nice to maybe personally get to know each other. You know, I'm a Mediterranean kind of a guy. <laughs> so we're like in, in, uh, in uh, personal relations and stuff. Uh, and uh, eventually maybe take uh, what I consider to be historic picture of the first senators of a uh, system by live for a long time. If you guys are okay with that, I can make the arrangements uh, and uh, have all of us um, take a nice uh, picture. That, that That's the thought. So I, I my questions, Angelo, are purely logistical. Sure. Do you, do, where do you see us first? Uh, the commitment was originally that we would meet virtually. So it, we would have to arrange a time and a place that permitted everyone to be right. in the same location, unless we're doing a screen grab, which could be interesting. Um, so do you imagine that there is a way logistically to get all of us at, to the same campus for a Senate meeting that permits this photo to be taken? Well, we are like 30, 30 something people. We're not like, you know, we, I, I, I think so. But uh, I can take suggestions. I'm sure um, maybe many of you will know a place where we could go. I would uh, select a central place, maybe, uh, that would be convenient for everybody. Um, but again, it's just a proposal. If you guys want to do it, I'll get the chair of that. So is there a motion to ask Angelo to identify a time and place for a in-person meeting to facilitate collegiality and the inaugural photo? Roberta. I move to empower Angelo to coordinate such an effort. Is there a second? I'll, I'll second it, Peter Bennett. Very good. Thank you very much. Any further discussion? Sounds like fun. Fun okay. is good. <laughs> all those in favor of all those in favor, please raise your hand now. All those in favor, please raise your hand now.
John, what's our vote count? Uh, we're at 29. This is that what I'm counting? 30. 31. <laughs> 30. Back to 30. I believe 30 is our optimum number, correct? <laughs> I don't yeah. get it because I'm not voting right now. I was going to abstain. So how are we at 30 if 29. 30 is our voting number? It, it's jumped around a little bit and now it's back up to 30. It's, it's you know, it's it's moving. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Do you have a count, John? Now we're at 32. We're at 32. All right, very good. Everybody lower your hands. Clearly, the mission carries. Jacqueline, your hand is still up. Ariel. Are there any other hands up, John? No, we got that one done in under five minutes. First time. Good job, everybody. <laughs> well, we're, we're not quite there because we still have to ask, are there any, does, uh, are there any objections? Does anyone vote no? Are there any objections? There are no objections. Are there any abstentions? Two. Yes. Crystal abstains. All right, very good. The motion carries. Two. Angelo, you have an assignment, sir. Thank you. Okay. Right, thank you. And we're moving on to the resolution from Capital Community College. At our last meeting, we said we would vote. Uh, we would hold a discussion to consider a vote to endorse. Is there a motion related Allen? Well, I was, I was going to say that the gateway faculty staff council did uh, adopt this resolution. Uh, so I'd be happy to make a motion. Uh, that we, uh, that we endorse the re resolution. Is there a 2nd, this is Roberta 2nd. Any discussion. Very good. If you support, Alan has if a you su oh, I'm sorry. Was there late discussion or? Yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, I mean, a couple of things did come up, uh, you know, this, there are things to consider and 1, uh, of course, we'd like to see greater, you know, uh, full time. Uh, faculty presence on all the campuses and not such a reliance on adjuncts, but, um. You know, there are staff members who teach uh, as adjuncts, uh, retirees who teach as adjuncts. Um, you know, so if we're, as this resolution is sort of pushing to get to, I think like 75% or something like that full time, um, you could eliminate some opportunities for people that do rely on teaching as adjuncts. Um, so it's just something for us to be aware of, you know, that uh, there, there could be some adverse uh, impact on, uh, on employees, you know, um, again, retiree staff members, even faculty who do overloads. Um, so those are just some things to consider, but I, uh, we did pass it and, and I did support it, but um, I think there are some nuances that we should be aware of. Thank you, Roberta. Thank you. And along those same lines, um, there are some of our adjunct faculty have full time jobs in their field, engineering, business, um, and the sciences. And we want that that constant innovative expertise to be available to our students. So that was um, one of the concerns that was also brought up among our faculty. Thank you. And I'll just jump in before Peter and say that that was some of my concern as well. I thought the percentage was a little bit higher than. Maybe needed to be. That was my hesitation. Go ahead, Peter. All right. Um, in the fall of this past year, 
uh, our institutional research people uh, told me that 46% of our classes were taught by adjuncts. So I'm not sure, I mean, unless the fall was a very strange time at Norwalk, well, it always is. Um, if we, unless we're really different, I would I would think that the sort of estimations of seventy five percent of the classes or uh, even sixty percent of the classes may be a little high, uh, because basically under this uh, under this bill we'd pretty much meet the standards for two or three years from now uh, already. Uh, now one has to um, consider also. What what do we do with these people that we're getting rid of? Now, the intent seems to be that we'll have more full-time jobs that we'll be able to incorporate uh, these part-time faculty members into a full-time position. I am not so sure that we're going to get the money for this kind of thing. In other words, I have a feeling that the government, the adjuncts, but people are not going to replace them. And then we're going to have to go back to getting more adjuncts again. So I'm I'm just a little concerned. I I, I appreciate the idea that we would like the students to have interactions with full time people who have offices and office hours and can meet with the students and have a commitment to the school. I understand that entirely, but at the same time, um, the the point being that. Uh, Part-time faculty sometimes have unique expertise that that, and this is the only way we can get it to the students needs to be considered as well. So I'm sort of neutral on this bill. Um, I, I see a lot of un, unintended consequences. So that's all I need to say. Thank you, Peter. Michael. Yeah, um, I just just I, I'm a guest at the meeting, and I appreciate the the. They allow allow me to speak. Um, I am in general supportive of the bill. I'm concerned about the unintended consequences, and specifically that the bill does not include the resources to hire the faculty, um, the full time faculty. Um, in the land of unintended consequences, um, I have heard anecdotally that the AAUP union at the universities has similar language in their contract. And I've also heard stories of schedules being built and then courses being taught by adjuncts being canceled in order to meet the ratio. So while the intention was good that a certain percentage would be taught, it resulted in not more sections for full timers, it resulted in less sections for part timers. Um, and, you know, I don't know, I know L has a strong background with the bargaining units and it may be worthwhile checking with. AAUP because um, unfortunately I heard that it happened at Central, for instance, a number of years ago. And I think there was some language around summer courses had to have a certain percentage taught by full timers. And the reality was part time sections were cut to make those ratios. Um, that being said, personally, I'm supportive of full time and I, I would love to have more full timers. I don't know what the magic number is of percentages. Um, but I do think that the finances behind the bill are just as important as the sentiment. Um, so it just might be something to research to find out if if there are unintended consequences that could harm our edge. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Any other thoughts or input? This is Roberta. I was just gonna piggyback on what Mike said. Those consequences of cutting classes then limits the availability of course selection for students. This is a hard one. Is there a possibility for us to, you know, have some sort of language in our support of this bill saying something like we support this, but uh, would be interested in seeing an adjustment to the percentage or do we have to provide a full support or no support? Uh, well, action? We, we could do anything, but what we asked was that any questions or concerns be brought before Senate be, be shared prior to Senate so that those could be considered. And we didn't spend a whole lot of time um, doing the deep dive <laughs> together. And we do have a motion on the table to endorse as presented that doesn't preclude us from when we transmit it 
from including language that says in that Connecticut State Community College Senate supports 1105 with the following um, bringing the following issues to your attention or something like that. Uh, Mike, is your hand up again or still? That's a whole number. Okay, very good. All right, folks, we have a motion on the table to endorse. Please raise your hand if you support uh, 1105. We have a motion on the table to support. Please raise your hand if you support Senate Bill 1105. John, are hands still popping up? Yeah, they're kind of I have 21 right now, but I'm going to double check on that. Okay, folks, let's give this five more seconds. Five more seconds. Yeah, 21. 21. Okay, everybody lower your hands. Lower your hands. Anyone opposed to this motion? Please vote now. Anyone opposed to this motion? Please raise your hand. You have three. Four. Four, very good. Folks, lower your hand. Anyone abstaining? Any abstentions? Please raise your hand. Seven, eight. Okay, very good. At eight total? Yep, I mean, some folks have put their hands on now, but yeah. Okay, so, so the motion carries. The motion carries. Thank you. All right, we have addressed the items from old business. We have three items for new business. However, we did say that we would return to the issue of English as a second language. Uh, the motion failed, which returned it to Amy, who agreed to consult with the foreign language folks. Is Amy, are you still on the call? She had to jump off. She, she had to jump off. So um, the, the motion failed, but that returned it to uh, leadership at Connecticut State, and she was going to consult with both Angelo as well as Hannah Moore and uh, Miguel and then Nicola. I believe that was the order. Other way, Nicola, then Miguel. Thank you. Nick? Real quick question, just so I follow this, right? Like I understand the the policy as written is not the people at this on this Senate are not happy with it. But I'm not following how we can Amy's not tap we have to request a substantive change in the wording of that policy. And the BOR right now can just say no, we're leaving it as is. Right, so I'm a little kind of confused as to why, like, I find I'm fine with sending it back to Amy, but I don't understand how. This is actually going to change. Well, so, um, Nick, you're, you're right. So I, I think we, we actually did kind of. Go, go down a, a bit of a rabbit hole. Um, we need to update the language, right? So that from the Connecticut community colleges. To the CP state, and I think that that was what they were trying to do initially. I think what happened was that the foreign fa language faculty on the call got caught off guard by a policy that they did not know existed, um, and there are concerns about that. 
we cannot propose a change of a, a, a formal substantial change to the policy. And so the comment that I wanted to make was that um, I, I think that, that what's, what's good is that we're delaying for a month because that will give Amy a chance to talk to the ESL Council and the foreign language consortium for the Connecticut Community Colleges to see if we can come to some sort of agreement in terms of proposing new policy language that would be a substantive change to the BOR. That's not something that's A, going to be done in the next month, or B, that is, is, is urgently needed to happen. What urgently needs to happen, as I understand it, and Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, but, but I believe what needs to urgently happen now is simply the name change from Connecticut Community College to CT State. And I think people in general are fine with that. It was the underlying content, and then we got sucked into that whole discussion. So I, my hope would be that over the next month, Amy, the ESL Council, the Foreign Language Consortium all talk. All right, we come back next month, we can change the, the name, right? And then, and then moving forward, take a look at, is there a consensus on creating new language for a policy and then proposing that language to the BOR? Thank you, Alan. Thanks. Yeah, um, right. And, uh, but what I was kind of su suggesting was that the language in the policy, the language as it exists, doesn't actually reflect the policy as implemented. Uh, when you have five courses and it says intermediate and um, two, intermediate to advanced, specifically can earn foreign language credit, that doesn't seem to be the actual policy, the, the practice, right? If it's only the top two levels, the fourth and fifth level. The second and third courses could be deemed or considered as intermediate as well, right? Certainly the third. And while those get uh, provide credit, humanities credit or elective credit, they don't earn um, foreign language credit, which is what the policy says. So, you know, I, I think perhaps if, if the language reflected the actual practice, we wouldn't be proposing a substantive change, but although may still have to go to the board for, for approval. But, okay, thanks. Thanks, Alan. All right, very good. Thank you for the clarifications, folks. Um, if I will make sure that Amy reaches out to, to both um, constituent groups and hopefully we can just gain the clarity that we need in order to make progress on that policy at our next meeting. Let's see, where does that bring us? Uh, Hannah Laura has a quick question, I think, and then we're moving on to a new business. A new business. I just wanted to say, I think the foreign, I, I had a quick chat with um, Jamilet and I think she's going to invite me to a foreign language consortium. I would like to uh, work with Amy before that, and maybe uh, we can get clarification um, to everybody's satisfaction. Great, and uh, we'll we'll do our best, folks, to get any updated policy out to you so you can review it, and maybe even put forward your questions beforehand. So, all right, very good. Thank you, folks. I appreciate that you kept that a really nice, tight, tight discussion, so we're able to move on to new business. So the first item of new business is Senate meetings. I have three different things for you. Uh, the first is our structure. Well, actually, let me do attendees first because that one's easier. The first is attendees. Uh, for the bylaws committee, what is the expectation for permitting attendance? So we want folks to be able to to, to, to join our meetings, but what does join mean? Can they participate in our discussions? I mean, we did see that we had more votes than we had senators at one time today. Um, and so we will try to address the voting aspect through utilizing Zoom if we prevail on that issue, because Zoom would permit each of us to rename ourselves in the meeting. So everyone who has Senator or SEN in front of their name, we would know exactly who can vote. So using Zoom would permit that. 
WebEx doesn't give us that flexibility. And if, uh, you, if you joined late, we are asking for three to five volunteers to serve on a work group to bring Zoom to become to the Senate so that it is our primary platform. Um, is there a question there? Well, I, you, you just asked a question from the bylaws perspective. So, so the, the question I have that, that intersects with bylaws is how do we manage if, if we had 75 people join because we were discussing a really hot topic, how do we manage folks who want to participate but are not members of Senate? And that is a question that several of you have asked. I do want to limit this to like 10 minutes today because we don't have a lot of time left, but I am giving you this question so that we can begin to solve that problem. Uh, John, what's the order of, of hands? Stephen, then Alan, then Miguel. I, so just an idea, um, because I know like when people do like larger seminars and stuff, um, people get invited on the basis of participants and they can only put stuff into the chat. But then there's a subgroup of people who have been allotted in who are allowed to talk freely and like do the presentation. I don't know if we're allowed to do that format in this sense. Yeah, certainly it's technology technologically uh, solvable. Yes. Great. Thank you. Next. Yeah, I, um, I'd like to suggest that we consider um, uh, speaking uh, in the Senate meetings is either by senators or by invitation. Now, we've had some expertise from Maya and Mike today, um, and I think, uh, and we welcome that, but I think it should be either something that's scheduled in the agenda or uh, like a couple of times, oh, Mike, can you speak to that? Or Maya, could you speak to that? And then, of course, they're invited to speak, but um, but otherwise uh, not. Uh, and uh, that would be, um, of course, apply to uh, people not representing CT State as well. Could apply to other faculty or members of the public who are in attendance. I think that might be one way of of uh, managing it. And Alan, if we were distributing the agenda on our campuses or we're sharing the link, someone could certainly reach out ahead of time and say, hey, I'd like to address Senate and we would allot them time. Is that the kind of thing that you're thinking of there? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And and Good. and again, like in the course of our conversations a couple of times today, you know, we've asked Maya or Mike for their input, right? Or Amy, um, because we know that they're here and they they have relevant information. But there would sort of be the caveat that that um, and this is not nothing personal, but just I'm trying to think of a global way of managing this uh, that that they wouldn't be able to just jump in of their own volition. And that would be true for anyone who's not a senator. Right. Very good. Thank you. Other hands, John. Um, Miguel has a question and we have some folks that are dropping out because they have a hard stop at 2.30. Yeah, so, so just in terms of, of the bylaws committee, um, and I'm not the chair or anything, but, but we have not, I've been to, I think, all the meetings, and I don't believe we have discussed that, that sort of topic, the public participation. Um, it would be helpful to just get a sense of, of, of the Senate here today, um, and since we're not going to get to the bylaws today, um, uh, anyway, we, we can sort of in, in, incorporate that and make a recommendation next month. Um, I think that the idea of, of limiting speaking to um, senators and invited guests makes sense. Um, however, I would also suggest um, that we consider uh, having some sort of process for written feedback um, where, where people from across the system uh -huh. can, can send in communications because they want to communicate. Because I think it's important that you know, people be, have the opportunity to, to offer feedback. Um, now, of course, people can reach out to their senators as well. I mean, that's certainly another option, but uh, I think we want to try to make the process open and communicative as much as we can without logistically blowing the whole thing. Okay. Any final comments? Roberta has her hand. Thank you. Along those same lines, I, I like what Alan has to say, as well as Miguel. 
I think that as we've learned from information we received from Amy, from Mike, and from Maya, there are times that they have information that we are we don't have knowledge of, and then they may need to bring up. And I'm wondering if what the body feels about some ex officio um, members that are able to speak if they have the if they have the information that we need to know so that we can make an informed decision. Any thoughts? So they have the privilege of speaking, but not the privilege of voting. Kirsten. Um, yeah, Roberta, I'm just looking for clarification on that. Wondering if you mean ex officio as a regular attending member, or I guess that's what it would be, right? That's how the governance would. Would structure this committee, they would be a, like a permanent non voting member in attendance. Yeah, the position. Okay. Yeah, or, okay. or we could structure it even more if we wanted. And yeah, just you know, for that next meeting, if we're going to be talking about this, then this is something we should also have an idea about how to think about. It, it's it's Nicola, Roberta. Doesn't Alan's you know what he spoke to kind of cover that? We invite someone. We know someone sitting is in the meeting. We know that they have information or knowledge directly tying to the topic that we're discussing, and then we just ask them to weigh in on it. Yes and no. If, you know, if we, if we know that they have something to offer, but there was a couple times when Maya had knowledge to offer that we didn't ask her for that she, you know, kind of asked if she could chime in. And so I, I would want to make sure that we have a, a, a way for that to take place, especially given the fact that we are in these online situations, you know. Well, the hand raised okay, uh, does accomplish some of that if we leave that up. Brian, go ahead. You're still muted. I like the idea. I like the idea of the ex officios, but I think we should be cautious about that. Titles change all the time. We just lost two I don't, executive vice president people like a month ago or wherever they were, and restructures happen all the time. So I think we'd be cautious to see whether it's just a specific people who like. Maya and others who are ex officio because there's always going to be a provost or if we mm -hmm. want to go down that rabbit hole. Exactly. So I think this, this, this discussion itself uh, will be useful for the bylaws and charter committee. Um, and this was helpful. Thank you very much folks. There's 1 more issue related to structure before and and we're going to have to ask um, for just a few more minutes. I want to say that at our next meeting, we have resolved most of our old business, so we will be able to tend to new business more expeditiously. But on the issue of structure, um, some of our some of our senators were told they could not serve on both curriculum Congress and Senate, or their transition from their campus from their campus to CT State has become official and they were told they were no longer able to to represent their campus. Now I will share with you that I am deeply involved with the transition of many people, not just four C's but also ask me and AFT. So I'm very familiar with the transition from the campus individual transitions from the campus to CT State. And unless a senator's location changes I am of the opinion that they continue to represent their college or their campus unless or until their college makes a change. Unless or until their college asks for a change. So we are looking for a couple of comments to support that any elected senator continues to serve unless or until the campus they represent makes a change. Does anybody disagree with that? Very good. Thank you for su your support on that issue. All right, uh, that brings us to our, our next issue of registration times for students. Uh, Roberta and Miguel, I believe you put that on the agenda, but Brian, can you please introduce it? Because I think you had 
updated information related to this issue? I was prepared to. Uh, you, you have the additional information, Roberta, the change? I don't, I don't know anything about a change. I just know that in light of time, I didn't know if we had time for the discussion today. Well, we, how many people have we lost? We've lost a decent amount, Al. We're only up to 32 now. So there was 40 people on the call originally. Yeah, and as I said, there are only 33 senators. So, so did we yeah. lose senators or did we lose participants? Both. 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 Yeah, both. Okay. So, uh, as I said originally, I, I am open to just moving it until next month if we have to. Okay, then but we can do just, that. Yeah. All right. Ella, we also attend uh, tabling the meetings to next uh, the Senate meeting structure attendees discussion as well to further discussion for next meeting. No, we finished that one. We finished. Okay. Yeah, we finished that. So it looks like it looks like we've lost enough people that items B and C okay. will move to old business for our next meeting. Mm -hmm. Items B and C will move to old business for our next meeting. Uh, we have a few items left for Connecticut state policies, but hopefully those will go more expeditiously. We've, we've gotten better and better at this. Uh, any final comments before we adjourn? Uh, Ella, it's Nicola. We did not receive any volunteers for the Zoom committee. For Zoom. So just a reminder, maybe people can think about it and we can ask for next month for those volunteers. Next, we, we have to actually try to do the work before next month. So oh, if gosh. we don't have volunteers, it will be the executive council who continues to work on that. Fabulous. <laughs> Why you get paid the big bucks, Nick. All right, folks. Uh, the meeting is adjourned at 2.38. If I can ask the executive council to remain on the call, I would appreciate it. Thank you very much and have a good weekend. Have a good week. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good one.